I'll show show your active interest. Yeah, look at him. He's so good. He's quite the dog, isn't he? He's, he's royal. And he was chewing on his pizzle, so good. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. That's exactly right. <laughs> yes. That's that a motive. House. I know. Yeah. Yeah. He's sad because his puppy went home. Oh, I bet. Yeah, it looked like they were buddies, right? Now, was that, he, had he ever met the puppy? Kind of, um, and if I need a, 
focus down a little bit. See that zero, that minus there? Let's see. Okay, that's probably it. Okay. So anyway, this is the way it comes out of the bowl, and this would be how it's attached, this part right here. And that's the somatic cord. And of course, you're taking notes because anything I do here could be on the assessment. So just because this is reproduction. Uh, anyway, this is the spermatic cord, and I've got a diagram I'll show you. Anyway, it looks kind of nondescript because it's actually hidden be behind another membrane. So then I'm going to, so they did a good job here of taking it out of the membrane. And now I'm going to get this started and show you what's also, there's two parts in the sac. Where one, one part is where the sperm are stored and the other part is where they're made. So they're made in the testes, but below this membrane, and I can maybe pop it off here, I'm not sure how that's looking there, but, and it's slippery, which they usually are. I'm just trying to not cut too much here. Hold on for a second. There we go. See how that kind of popped out of that sac? Now we got a better view of the testis. And then, and so then sometime when we do reproduction, I'll bring a big boar testis, because I got a boar testis that's uh, four or five times this. There's my buddy. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Okay, so anyway, there it is. But do you see this little uh, bump on the end here? See how it, there's a structure on the testis? That's the epididymis, and I'll spell it out in a little bit when I get my hands dry. And you can cut the epididymis off without cutting the testis. Anyways, it's the part that stores the sperm. So now I'm going to just cut the testis and show you what the meat looks like. Now, what section am I doing on that testis right there that I just cut? What would you say anatomically? Transverse. Transverse, yes. Perpendicular to the long axis. And now you can kind of see, see there's that middle part there? I know it shows up better here in live, but there's like a center part. And the testis is made up of like, think of a, a bunch of garden hoses that are stuffed in this structure, but all the garden hoses lead to the middle where the sperm are being produced or put into. So there's a middle part called the reedy testis, and I'll spell it out later. And then it goes to this outside structure, this bulb here called the epididymis. And, thank you, sister, what a good. Uh, and the epididymis is a separate thing, okay? Thank you, Sarah, that's fine. No, that's fine. Um, is a separate part, and I made, I made an X here, and I'll show you a little diagram. From that wall to over here, that's how long the epididymis is in the human. So it's like a long tube that's crushed together, not crushed together, but packed into this structure that's along the side, okay? So it's amazing. So the sperm, the sperm are produced in the testes, but then they're put into that epididymis where they mature, and then they're ready to fertilize an egg after they leave the epididymis. Anyway, that's one of the uh, sacs, the one of the testes, and um, I wanted to show you that before they get um, spoiled, because it doesn't take long for things like that to not Thing well. Okay, so let me show you those spellings of that. Hey, buddy, what's new? Hey, look at this, how handy this is. Perfect. Okay, can I give him this? Yeah. Here. Gloria, what do you think? It's always interesting. Okay, so let me spell that out for you. Here's epididymis, <laughs> E-P-I-D-I-D-Y-M-I-S, and what does it do? It stores sperm on the outside of the testis. How long is it in humans? 21 feet from here to there. Estimate, and it's all one tube. It's not 
many tubes. There's many tubes in the testis, but the epididymis is one. So you've got this long a tube, and you package it in that structure. Then, here is a little diagram of that. Let's see, I thought I had it rolling up. No, I guess that's it right there. So let me just review that here. The spermatic cord, remember, that's where all the blood vessels come in, all the nerves. That's where the sperm are delivered out through the, the uh, vas deferens. And so this is a good diagram here. You have this testis, and then you have the structure on the testis. And when I was at Nebraska, they were doing studies with bores where we would castrate bores, and then we would weigh the whole structure, then dissect the epididymis off, and weigh the epididymis, and then weigh the testes, because then, in essence, the bigger the testes, the more sperm that are made. And so I think they were selecting for a testes size in a bore. And if you've ever seen a bore, a bore has bigger testes than a bull, although the bore body weight is way smaller. Because the female tract in the uh, sow is bigger than a cow's reproductive tract. So there's gotta be more fluid. So I'm just spelling these things out before we go on to our neurology. Okay, there's epididymis. Okay, well, let's see what else. Okay, so anybody have any questions on that? There's two, the testes are always, if it, they're normal, they're equal in size. One's not bigger than the other. They might be a few grams different. And then in the testis, all the sperm, the sperm production is equal on the top, middle, and bottom. You know, it's not like the top is making more sperm or the middle. But it's really quite a process. And we'll get more into that when we do reproduction. But somebody said, you, can I give you these bull testings, right? And of course, I'm always saying, yes, this, that's my job. Okay, now I'm going to do neurology. And before I do that, I want to get, oops, sorry. Was the middle of the column? Oh, the reedy testing, sorry, R-E-T-E. -E. And that's two words, reedy testing. And there's some other, you know how things have multiple names, but that's what I call it, the reedy testis. And that's the center part of the testis where the sperm gather um, before they um, get to the epididymis. Now, royal, we've seen royal a couple times, right? At least, you know, over time, I've seen them for like a number of times now over a year. And I want to introduce, see, when we have animals, we don't, we also have to learn something. So I want to tell you about a study where you would make observations over time on the same individuals and what that name is called. You're happy, aren't you? Yeah, happy. Yeah, talk to people. And so that's what I've got up here. Longitudinal study. So I want to introduce that a little bit. And uh, on my drive here this morning, I was thinking this would be a neat study to start with freshmen. Listen to what I'm going to define it first, and I'll tell you a couple things. Okay, a longitudinal study is usually where, over time, you make an observation on the same population of animals. So, like Royal, I've seen him. Oh my gosh, uh, a year ago at least first or whatever. He hasn't changed one bit. His attitude is the same. It's always like, "Hey, I'm happy to be alive," all that stuff. So, a longitudinal study is where you observe. Um, individuals over a period of time. And the period of time might be weeks or a college career. And then you can maybe draw some uh, conclusions from a longitudinal study. So we're doing, in a sense, a longitudinal study of Royal. And I could say, every time I see him, he's the same dog, he's the same dog. But maybe when he gets older, he'll be less active, maybe maybe wants to interact less, okay? So now let me tell you about a famous uh, longitudinal study in humans. Here it is, 57 up it's called. <clears throat> and it's a movie you can see. I think part of it is on uh, YouTube, maybe part of it. <laughs> He's looking all over. Here's what they did. They took a group of kids when they were about seven years old. This was in England. so. You know how the English, sometimes it's hard to, for us to, if they talk fast, sometimes it, we lose it. They watched kids at seven, they interviewed them. What are you gonna be when you grow up, blah, blah, blah. 
Then they did it at 14. Then they did it at 21 and all the way to 56. And then they might have made one past this. But here's what they did then. So they had little Johnny. They were asking Johnny at 7 what he wants to do, then at 14 and all this stuff. But then what they do is they splice it all, and you see Johnny in a longitudinal study at 7. And then the next little segment is Johnny at 14, then Johnny at 21. So you don't see the other kids, you know, in between. You see Johnny in all these interviews. And when I saw it, this is dating me a little bit, when I saw it, it was called 42 Up, because they do it about every seven years. And I was with an audience, and the audience was stunned. We like all looked at each other after it was over. It's like, do you know what? What they were saying and what they were like at seven, it was like 42, when they were 42, it was the same kid. And it, you've never seen a movie like that, right? Because you never put it all together. And then the narrator said this at the end. Show me the child at five, and I give you the man. It was stunning, you know, the man, the generic man. But it's like, if you see these kids, they're really not going to change after that. So it was, show me the child at five, and I give you the man. And it was stunning. Uh, so if you're interested in human psychology or human development. It was fantastic, and it's a longitudinal study. Now, wouldn't that be fun to do with freshmen in college? And I might do this uh, like next year. Take 10 and sci freshmen and interview them when they, before they've had any classes. What do you think is going to happen at college? Can you see this? Uh, what's your goals? How many uh, credits are you going to take this semester? You know, what do you think you'll be doing in two years? And then, so yeah, that's the beginning of the freshman year. And then at the end of every semester, get them back through their whole college career. And then you splice it together and you show Jane all her, through her whole interviews. Wouldn't that be stunning? That would be stunning. What they think they're going to be doing before they have their first class. And then when they're the super senior, fifth year, <laughs> I, and they said they were going to get three, done in three and a half years, now it's five and a half. <laughs> and they were going to be a brain surgeon, but now they're going to work at McDonald's. No, that's, that's terrible. I, I just think it would be fascinating. I just might do that. Wouldn't that be funny? I mean, not funny, it'd be cool. Okay. Let's do a little neurology. Okay, so before I draw these things, and I'm going to draw them in a minute. If you're interested in human medicine, and some, I know there's some people in here. Somebody, there were two people that went to my office and we looked at the human uterus and all the tissues I had down there, and I think the one person wants to be a surgeon. If you ever get into human medicine, read the books and stories by this guy, Oliver Sack. He left us about, he crossed over maybe a year or two ago. But not only was he a physician and a neurologist, but he was an incredible writer. And he would talk about his patients, write about these patients that he would have. You know, the mind is the, you know, kind of like the last frontier. But Oliver Sacks, incredible person, neurologist, a lot of good reading. So. Now I'm going to go back and reset my camera, then I'll draw a neuron talking to another neuron. Yeah. Royal, royal, royal. See how happy this is? This is good for all of us, and you are good too, aren't you? Yeah. Okay. So now I'm going to go to the document cam, and let's do the neuron talking to another neuron. And we'll talk about one-way communication. So then, if, as I'm doing this, if I'm not answering all your questions. Okay. So then, you know, I'm drawing impaired, so don't laugh at me when I do these things, because it's, you know, I can't really draw. I don't know what this looks like. Yes. 
Okay, so what I've got is two neurons piled on top of each other. A neuron is a nerve cell. You should know that in nervous tissue, it's not the main cell. The neuron is not the main cell in the brain. There's another cell called the glial cells, G-L-I-A-L. If they're more numerous, they support the neurons. Uh, so they provide structure and nourishment, but they're not actually doing the action potential. So I'll talk about the actual action potentials uh, in my next drawing. But so here's one whole neuron up here. There's like parts that receive messages, and those are called the dendrites. You know, I know it's in the videos too. So the dendrites are, is the information receiving part of the neuron. The action potential travels down, then the axon, to a synapse. And the synapse, in my case there, is where one neuron talks to another. So this information in the form of an action potential is flowing down in my chart, and it's not going the other way. So there's action potential. Now when action potential gets down here, it's done. It doesn't jump, jump across the cleft. Okay? So you have this axon with a depolarization, and then down here, when the depolarization gets there, that's the signal to release what the chem what's the chemical called? Acetylcholine. Well, you don't know it's not acetylcholine. What's in general the chemical release? Neurotransmitters. The acetylcholine is released when an axon is talking to a uh, muscle, right? So there's all kinds of neurotransmitters. Maybe a little sidebar. Some are excitatory, like they stimulate the next neuron, but some are inhibitory, which means they don't excite the subsequent neuron. So then I'll do um, neurotransmitters in blue, although blue is dark. So there's a chemical across the synaptic cleft, right? And then it binds to receptors. It's kind of like that muscle stuff, the motor end plate, but it's not a muscle cell, it's another neuron. So these are dendrites, just like up here. They depolarize, and then the action potential goes down this way. So the flow is this way, never the other way. It's impossible to have anything come here and then jump across up. So that's your one-way communication. So then, here's the kicker, sometimes this, these terms are not the best, but a nerve, right? What's a nerve? A nerve is a bundle of neurons. Like there's an optic nerve, okay? There are like 12 cranial nerves. If you go to some professional school, MD or DVM, right now they're learning about the cranial nerves. I, um, that neurotransmitter would have another name, right? Because that's the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Specifically for myocytes. Yeah, yeah. Be, there's like 50 neurotransmitters. There's all kinds of like, you know, there's serotonin, there's, you know, we won't really get into that much, but you should know there's all these chemicals that are released. But some cause uh, an action potential to start on the next membrane, but some make it less likely. So there could be excitatory or they could be inhibitory. There are these chemicals. Okay, so that's your one way. Now, does that answer your questions? Okay, so now let me draw a man-made graph of an action potential. Did he bonus that? <laughs> okay. He's not down. <laughs> He's thinking about it. Okay, so now this is man-made because this is like monitoring one spot. Maybe I'll get my graph back up here. So here, this is really important to know. Let's say I want to put a little voltmeter right here, right at that spot. That's what the graph is going to depict. It's not going to depict anything traveling down. It's going to depict that spot at resting and then if an action potential comes by. 
So remember, my next graph is that spot and that spot only over time, right? That's that's important because a lot of times they don't tell you that. It's like that spot. I'm not moving along the axon. I'm looking at what's happening to that spot. So if I'm doing that spot, most action potentials, when you graph them out, they have millivolts on the y-axis. Okay, that's the membrane potential in millivolts. And then time on the x-axis. So nothing's moving. It's that spot on that axon. What's happening to the membrane potential at that spot? This is like critical. Okay, so then at that spot, if the neuron is at rest, it's called resting potential. And it's always above minus 70 millivolts. So I'm going to say right here is minus 70, here is 0, and then up here is, of course, plus. And so if we're plotting it over time, and it's at rest, my line would look like this over time. Okay. So then, let's say it's a sensory uh, receptor axon that's going to sense if a fly lands on Royal's muzzle. I've got to draw one other line here. T stands for threshold. So we have resting uh, potential, minus 70, threshold, something less than minus 70, right? Minus 60, minus 50, whatever it is there. Let's say a fly, a light, a tiny fly lands on his muzzle. It might look like this. And the fly flies away. Do you know his brain would not know the fly was there? The stimulus was not strong enough to reach threshold. So this would be a sub-threshold stimulus that then does not propagate a natural potential. But the sensory receptor sensed it. So here's another one, a little bigger. But it didn't get to threshold, and so it goes back to resting. Now let me make a dotted line for a threshold so I can keep track of it. So the dotted line says, I'm going to keep track of threshold so I know when I hit it. Okay, then we have a horse fly. If you ever know horse flies are nasty, they are like tenacious, they, they want to get you. And so then, if it landed on his muzzle, you would definitely feel it. So when it gets to the threshold, and this is important, you have an all or none response. Now we're going to get an action potential. And then maybe another one. No, I'm drawing paired, right? So <laughs> Okay, and then maybe another one. Okay, then it flies away. Okay, so now let's review. There's a threshold. If, if the change in membrane polarization doesn't reach threshold, an action potential is not propagated and the brain doesn't know what's happening. So we had that happen twice. Notice how there's this propensity to come back to rest, the resting minus 70. Now, if we get a big enough horse fly or fly, we get an all or none response. That means it happens. It didn't happen here, so that's none. When it happens, it's all. That's like that light switch there. You know, the light switch is all or none. It's not dimming. It's like, if I don't have enough pressure to put the light switch up, that's like here. Just like that. But as soon as I get enough pressure, all the lights come on. I don't have any choice. 
Notice if I have three actual potentials, are they all the same amplitude? Yes. Actual potentials are always the same amplitude on any given axon. But the brain can tell how heavy the fly is by the number of actual potentials per unit time. The heavier the horse fly, the more actual potentials per unit time. So let me do that. Let's say we had a real big horse fly. And you know what I'm trying to do here. So here it is. Over here, you have more per unit time, right? So you have an increase in frequency. That's what this is showing. So once you hit threshold, an increase in frequency is a code for how intense it is. In my case, how heavy the fly was. Maybe there's two flies, there's three flies, whatever. So then I got one last term here. Well, I guess more than one last term. <clears throat> Notice though how a little stimulus made a little depolarization, and I'll get that. But then a little bit heavier thing made a little more depolarization, right? So if a little input results in a little output, and then a little more input results in a little more output, that's called a graded response, G-R-A-D-E. So this graph actually shows you a graded response and then an all or none. A graded response is like if you drove to campus this morning, the more pressure you put on the gas pedal, usually the faster you go. That's graded. What if your car drove all or none? You start it and it, boom, hits maximum speed. That's, I've seen people drive like that. <laughs> and not use their turn signal. Uh, yeah, okay. Any question on that? Because I've got one more graph to draw and I want to name things. Better. Is there like a specific um, time frame for how long refractory periods usually last or is that different based on individual or species? That right, been? right. For any given nerve, she made she made the term refractory period. So I'm, my next drawing will show that, okay? Yeah. So let's, let's do that. I'm going to draw one action potential and then label some other things. So, again, I'm not even, you guys can label the axes. I'm going to do an action potential. Okay, so there's resting. Resting potential. There's threshold, there's zero, plus up here. Okay, so now I have resting potential. Any time, okay, so now I guess I should say there, it's polarized, right? This is a polarized situation. There's separation of charge. The inside of the membrane is more negative than the outside, so we've got polarization. So we got polarization. Anytime you go up, that's called depolarization. And then when you're coming back down, that's repolarization. So we have polarized, we have depolarized, we have repolarized. Then we have hyperpolarized. Hyperpolarized is when the membrane potential goes past resting. Right here, hyperpolarized. Sometimes people call that, well, I'll just say repolarized, so hyperpolarized. But then it has this propensity to come back to resting, okay? Now in here, maybe I'll put like right here, refractory. So when it's like below threshold, it's not likely to start another action potential. And so that's called the refractory period. Okay, 
and that's what the question was. So this refractory period is on any given axon the same all the time. Okay, unless something other other things are interfering it. But normally then the, the refractory period is constant. Okay. But now, lo and behold, notice how when I said neurotransmitters, you know, if a neurotransmitter is excitatory, it does this, right? And it causes an action potential. You know, the neurotransmitter goes across the cleft and excites the next membrane, and you get this. What happens if the neurotransmitter is called inhibitory? And here's here's the maybe most famous inhibitory neurotransmitter, GABA. It's all capital G A B A, GABA. It stands for something I don't remember, you know, but GABA. Here's what happens if GABA comes across to the resting potential. You get a new resting potential as long as it's there. Does that make the axon more likely to fire the next time or less likely? Less. Why? Is it further away from threshold? Is it a farther space? Yes. Because now if it's here, it has to get up to here to fire off. That takes more stimulation. So that's an inhibitory neural transmitter. Yes? So is it hyperpolarized or just that? Well, this is hyperpolarized because you you went past the resting. This would be, I guess you could say it's hyperpolarized because of the inhibitory neurotransmitter. You could say that. Because it is hyperpolarized relative to what it normally is, right? This is hyperpolarized, so in this case you could say it's hyperpolarized as well, but then you'd have to say because of inhibitory neurotransmitter, whereas this is just the normal neurophysiology of the ion flow. But if, if you have a lot of inhibitory neurotransmitters, the nerve is less likely to fire. Okay? That's neural function. Anybody have any questions on that? I think that's a perfect spot to end this test test. I'll just leave it on the end here if you want to see anybody go by. Color. Anybody ever hear eat Rocky Mountain oysters? Not a one. I should bring some. Have you? Oh, you've heard of them. Heard and eating them are two different things. Find some Rocky Mountain oysters for us. A review session. I'll draw them in. <laughs>